Hi everyone, welcome to Commotion Labs once again. Um, my name is Suni and as many of you might know, I manage this floor. Um, for those of you who are brand new to our program, um, Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator that hosts high-tech startups both inside and outside the UW community. Um, we have three buildings located in the greater UW campus. Um, this floor in the back has 24 different startups that are working on applications for augmented and virtual reality. And then our second building over in Fluke Hall hosts companies that are working on medical devices, clean tech, green tech. They also have the makerspace over there, which has recently become open to the public. And then our third building is over in Startup Hall, and that hosts IT and software companies, um, as well as the Techstars cohort and Bunker Labs. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the fourth event of our five-part blockchain basics series. Um, this series is meant to um, approach technology in an accessible way to those of you that are not familiar with the tech. Um, please note that our next event is in two weeks. We have a two-week hiatus. Um, it's going to be on um, May 8th, and it's going to be titled Tulip Coin Bubble, Hopes and Fears of Blockchain. For that event, we're going to be hearing from the investment community about their opinions on blockchain. Many thanks to our sponsors, the Seattle Angel Conference, for collaborating on this event. Thank you, John. As well as our other sponsors, the Seattle Angel Fund and, our Se and the Seattle Entrepreneurs Club. I'm thrilled to welcome our experts for today's event. Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to let John introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, before we get going with the introductions, um, we have a couple of things that are going on. Uh, the Seattle Angel Conference is coming on May 16th. So if you care about angel investment, um, talk to me about that, seattleangelconference.com. And then the Seattle Entrepreneurship Club is doing um, a startup weekend around blockchain the first weekend in May. And so if you go to startupweekend.org, people who want to sort of dive into um, making a business out of blockchain might want to participate in that. So for today, what we're going to be doing is exploring the question of blockchain and business models and explore that in detail and try and um, explore the processes about where that might work and where that might not work. How many people have gone through the I know what blockchain basics lecture somewhere before? Maybe 60%, okay. And how many people have been attending all of these workshops and have been at all, almost all of them? Maybe 30%. Okay, good, thanks. So <clears throat> we have a wide range of people who are uh, joining us today. I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves. So Alexander, would you start? Sure. Uh, I'm Alessandra Guerra. Hold it, hold it tighter, yeah. Super close. Uh, Alessandra Guerra, I am a co-founder and director of strategic planning at a local startup called Nori, like the seaweed. Um, we are on a mission to reverse climate change. And I just uh, packed up and left my job at a utility working on emerging technology in December from LA and then drove up here to do that. So I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about that. Perfect. Uh, Amit Mittal, I am the uh, co-founder and chairman of Trusted Key. It's a digital identity uh, platform built on blockchain. I'm excited to talk to you about Trusted Key. And my, uh, my name is Mike Monahan. I'm the chief of strategy for Look Lateral. It's an art company that is launching Theme Art, which is the fractional mar marketplace of art. We put uh, high value artwork on the blockchain and allow people to buy fractional ownership of that artwork and trade it on a uh, open platform. I'm also the founder of a uh, blockchain uh, delegation service for a new uh, blockchain Tezos, which is a delegated proof of stake system, which is different from a proof of work system. And that's just my own personal pet project. And my name is Alex Wajkowski. Uh, I came from a quite uh, northern and uh, far away country from here, so it's approximately 10,000 uh, miles from here. The country name is Estonia, and uh, I'm executive vice president in uh, the biggest uh, IT company in the Baltic States. So here I'm not so much as an expert in blockchain, but rather as a practitioner who has a certain experience in building of, uh, well, 20 years long experience in building of e-governance, e-identity, and then so on and so on. So. so just so that we're all in the same context, what I would like to do is to have Mike sort of go through a real quick, this is what blockchain is. So we have all the little technical vocabulary in our heads while we dive into the business models. Great, thank you. Uh, very often when I present these type of things, you get about a third of the room who knows blockchain very well and a majority of the room who doesn't know what blockchain is. So to have a productive conversation later, it's good to just get the basics down. 
So I'm just going to boil it down to as, as basic as I can make it and use some analogies. So to start off, we need to know uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, cryptography. Now, what I like to think of uh, the SHA algorithm, which is basically the basics of the blockchain uh, cryptology, it's like a magic blender. You put ingredients in, you blend it using the SHA algorithm, and something comes out, which is a hash. That will always be the same, no matter what, as long as you put the same ingredients in. But you can never unblend. And that's the real key, is that what goes in always has the same thing that comes out, but it never goes backwards. And it's important later on when you start talking about why you need this hash when it comes to linking the blocks in a blockchain together. So what exactly is a blockchain? A blockchain quite literally is just a fancy ledger. It's like an accountant writing in a, in a ledger log, but that ledger is encrypted and it's linked together to the previous page. Now on the previous slide, we talked about the hash algorithm. That's the thing that helps link it together. You take a little bit of the ingredients from the previous block, from the hash, you put it into the next block, and then when you re-blend it, those, those blocks are now linked together. So what is on each block chain is the data, but the blockchain itself is the structure. Now, one of the things that, that makes really good blockchains are the fact that they're distributed. You can have a private blockchain. I can have a blockchain on my computer, and it does all the work, but it's not as effective as if that blockchain is on everybody's computer, because I can always just change it on my computer. The more computers that a blockchain is on, the less likely you're going to be able to have anyone try to hack that blockchain because it's distributed. Now, what do I like? I like to call the original blockchain us. We, we are the original blockchain, genetics. Every single generation, you pass on a little bit of your genetics to the next person, and then onward and onward, you gain new genetics throughout uh, every generation, but you can never go back in time. You can always link back through your line, and you only move forward. So I like to put the uh, picture of uh, Back to the Future, that if you try to change history, the future is going to also change with it. So you better watch out. So what is the difference between a blockchain and digital currency? Because oftentimes you hear Bitcoin and Bitcoin. Bitcoin the blockchain, Bitcoin the currency. And they think that it's synonymous. Uh, the, the currency is what's on the blockchain. It's what you're tracking to, to make sure that you have correct transactions, that no one's cheating you that a transaction uh, actually gets debited and credited the correct location. And the blockchain itself is the structure that holds the data. We have things like uh, first generation Bitcoin, second generation Ethereum. Uh, but one of the questions that we always have to ask ourselves is that if you can track currency, why can't you track something else? So in my company, we're tracking artwork. We're fractionalizing it, we're putting it on the blockchain, and we're tracking every one of those little pieces as if it's like a little piece of a uh, cryptocurrency, and we're trading it on the uh, blockchain. Now finally, the, one of the major innovations in blockchains are smart contracts. Smart contracts were really revolutionized by Ethereum. Uh, it takes a relatively dumb ledger. Bitcoin is a great product. You can transfer uh, uh, Bitcoin as long as you value Bitcoin as, a, as an asset. But beyond that, it's relatively uh, low feature. The smart contract is a digital escrow. And that's very important when you think that if you want to eliminate trust in the network, one, you've done that through the blockchain. You know what the ledger is. But how do you trust that when you transfer funds, you're going to get the services and goods that you paid for? The smart contract does that. Essentially, it says it's an if-then-that statement. If you do this, then that happens. And if, uh, if it rains tomorrow, I get paid $5. If uh, you give me the service, I pay you $10, $10 or 10 Ethereum or whatever the cryptocurrency is. So it really eliminates a lot of the trust involved with actual transactions. With all of those put together, you can start creating businesses. And that's where we're starting to see now real use cases of blockchain, utilizing everything that we've just seen and trying to come up with very clever ways of actually turning this into a real business. And I think that's what we're going to start talking about on this panel uh, today. Uh, I don't think we're going to get into Q&A. Maybe at the end we'll, we'll do Q&A. Yep. Great. So how many people here have a blockchain-oriented business that they are currently in the middle of? Uh, maybe 20%. Okay. So um, we see this phenomena of uh, greenwashing where we want to be doing sustainability stuff. So I take my old stuff that is not sustainable and I put a pretty picture on the front of it and I paint it green and I call it sustainable, right? And so we have the same kind of business logic going on around blockchain where I take a business where that business is not 
particularly different than anything else, and I wrap blockchain around it, and now I have something. The extreme version of that is Long Island T, which just changed its name to Long Island Blockchain and changed their value by you know 300 percent. So um, there's a certain amount of weirdness in this blockchainy space that we're in, and I want to focus back on the things that create real value. And so I think we have some examples of that, but. To set the framework for that, I'd like Amit to go through how could you possibly make money with blockchain? Um, great question. I think uh, everybody in this room is, <coughs> is uh, thinking about the question in, in different ways. Um, I have a taxonomy where I think there's basically five ways in which you can participate uh, in the blockchain ecosystem. So one is uh, you could be a cryptocurrency miner. Okay, and you know that was arguably the first application of of blockchain and the first way where people said, "Hey, I can make money." Um, you know, in some ways, the the cat is out of the bag there. People have been mining, and you know, uh, the algorithm is a commodity, the mechanism a commodity, and the real differentiator there is access to cheap power. So, if you have access to cheap power, you can make money. Otherwise, your margins are going to be basically at zero. Okay, so I think you know that ship has sailed. The second thing you could do is you could say, hey, I want to be um, a digital currency exchange. Just like a broker in, in, uh, for the stock market, you can be a broker and an exchange in cryptocurrency land. Um, my belief is that because the value of advisory services there are negligible, the margins on that business as well will be basically close to zero. Okay, so it's a commodity business. The third thing you could do is you can say, hey, I want to uh, play the ICO lottery. Uh, now, if you, if you had this idea in late 2016 or early 2017, uh, you could have made some money there. Uh, you could also be at the receiving end of an SEC, SEC subpoena right now, <laughs> so a double-edged sword. Um, but you know, the ICO game, while there are legitimate ICOs uh, that are possible, it's also an area, at least in the short term, that is fraught with regulatory and legal landmines. So, you know, buyer or participant beware. Um, number four is you can be in the picks and shovels business. And by that, what I mean is if you believe blockchain is here to stay, and uh, I hope most all of us on the panel believe that, and many of you in the room believe that, then rather than try to be the most creative person and saying, hey, I'm going to find the right application, you could be an enabler of the blockchain ecosystem. And Trusted Key, for example, is in the picks and shovels business. And then number five is you could say, I want to be an application writer, an application creator on blockchain. And so the example of the, uh, of the art exchange of the fractional art ownership is an example of such, such an application. And obviously we expect there are going to be thousands of such applications. It'll take a lot of creativity to wrap your head around why blockchain and what unique value blockchain brings to that but there, could be an interest, there will be an interesting set of use cases there. So then thinking about an interesting set of use cases, one of the things that blockchain does is it logs stuff. And it logs stuff in a way that um, you don't have to have the entity that started it to be around for you to still find the log. So anytime you have a startup where the startup is kind of shaky and you're creating some value inside that company, <coughs> then that company blows up and all of the servers go dead, you would feel bad if that value disappeared. And so if you put it on the blockchain, there's one way to manage it, right? And so um, <coughs> we had an Element 8. Do you know who Element 8 is? So Element 8 is the angel group in town which is doing uh, clean tech, environmental-oriented investment. And so they had a blockchain uh, uh, seminar and at that seminar they had a lawyer and a hundred percent of their examples were how I can do clean energy stuff by tracking some part of the ecosystem with blockchain sounds somewhat like what you're doing and so could you tell us how is it that blockchain actually <laughs> helps you make climate change better okay um, so it's not quite the same because what we're doing isn't necessarily clean energy related. Um, mm -hmm. 
So uh, Nori is on a mission to reverse climate change, and the way that we're doing that is creating an open, voluntary marketplace for carbon dioxide removal. <laughs> carbon dioxide, um, too much of it is the reason why we have climate change. So even if we do things like employ all clean energy and do energy efficiency and say maybe one day stop emitting, we would only plateau. So how do we start to go down on that curve and reach safe levels of CO2? That's the question. The answer is to remove carbon dioxide. Um, and we want to do this using blockchain in a transparent way so that, um, in a scalable way, so that anybody who's removing carbon dioxide, we call them suppliers, um, we could track all tons of CO2 being removed on our, on our ledger and then allow businesses and individuals alike to purchase those th certificates. They're called carbon removal certificates or CRCs. Um, so it's the fifth one of what this cat these categories you gave in terms of application, using blockchain as a way to achieve um, some type of goal or mechanism. And it's ours as a market mechanism for carbon dioxide removal. So I could just do a MySQL database and stuff all of that stuff in there. So why should I use blockchain instead of SQL to do it? Uh, well, now we're getting into like <laughs> data but side. Yeah, uh, I don't think that that's uh, appropriate. So the distributed part, right? I think you were talking about this earlier. Um, that's key. Uh, and also the transparency side. And so there's a lot of lessons that we've learned um, through carbon markets. I don't think, who here knows anything about carbon offset markets? Okay, like maybe 5% of the people in this room. Um, but carbon offset markets, to give you some background, are things like cap and trade in California that says like this is how much businesses are allowed to emit and you're responsible for decreasing um, or paying for extra emissions through this marketplace. Um, there's a lot of lessons that have been learned through that, um, and we've seen that like they don't even practice all the time double entry bookkeeping, so making sure that what was given out as a credit for one ton of CO2 was actually used only once. Um, sometimes they're used multiple times, which means you're emitting more than you even wanted them to. Um, so transparency is super key when it comes to keeping track of how much people are emitting businesses and how much is being removed. And that's why blockchain um, could be really useful for this. So I get uh, the ability to audit. I get the ability, because it's immutable, to see what's happening without having to trust any particular agent. Mm -hmm. So the, any of the bad players in the system uh, surface immediately. And it's distributed, so if you go away, the economy still keeps running. Yeah, exactly. And so the fact that you're a startup now is not really relevant because the data is always public forever. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So, um, and you've gone to BC and explored their mechanisms? Uh, no, not, I mean, so we, we're having a summit actually um, next week. So I'm surprised I'm even here because I'm organizing the summit and event planning. It's not fun. <laughs> I don't know if I'll do it again. <laughs> but uh, we do have, we're gonna have a panel there with a bunch of people. And one of our co-founders, we have a large co-founding team. We have seven co-founders, because it's, it's a big problem. Like you've got your engineering side, you've got your business development side. Um, one of our co-founders is Alden Donnelly, and she worked um, in Canada for over 25 years in creating carbon offset markets. Um, and now she has a very strong opinion about why they don't work. So now she's working at Nori <laughs> to try to create this voluntary marketplace. Um, and we're gonna have a whole panel then on like what's going on with carbon markets and how we can improve and actually create a marketplace that'll be something so new and exciting because it's gonna only be for carbon dioxide removal, um, not like reductions, which is like, oh, I emitted less than I did yesterday, so I get credit for that. No, it's like, okay, you did good, you removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, let's create certificates and keep track of that. Cool. And so on one side we have this tracking of uh, large distributed markets, but on the other hand we have tracking of ownership. So Mike, could you dive in a little bit long, uh, deep, more detailed into what stock markets for art looks like? Sure, sure. I, I don't like to specifically refer to them as stock markets because that's a, it's a security. Um, <laughs> when it comes to an asset, well, because a piece of a piece of art is just an asset. So uh, we we split apart the uh, a piece of art, and the important thing to to realize is that there's almost nothing new about anything that we're doing. That blockchain should be an, an enabler of doing something really, really well 
that already exists. You can take a million dollar painting and uh, five of us could all go in uh, and put 200 grand in that painting, hire a lawyer, uh, pay too much to that lawyer to uh, write up contracts, and then we would all own one fifth of that painting. Within that contract, maybe it says that I can resell my portion to whoever I want for however much I want, and I choose to sell it to somebody for a 5% gain. Well, I have to hire another lawyer, and they have to write up documents and pay too much and then go through that whole process. And then we probably have to log that into a record somewhere, make sure that uh, all the information is, is available. Uh, everything that, that, that I just said in some way has been done for probably even hundreds of years. You know, uh, asset ownership has split into multiple parties. What a blockchain does is it takes all of the difficult, complex, expensive, time-consuming aspects of it and trims it down and automates it. So the blockchain itself is just digital title. It it's quite literally replaces the title company. Instead of paying someone to uh, log it into uh, the books, we log it into uh, an immutable uh, record on the blockchain. Instead of the lawyer, that's the terms and conditions. When you can take terms and conditions and make everyone agree to them and basically autofill the, uh, the fields, you've essentially replaced your lawyer. Sorry, lawyers. Um, when it comes to smart contracts, that's our digital escrow. D basically, it says that you agree to the terms uh, that you will pay X in exchange for Y, and it's automated. Now, the very last portion of any contract is consideration. Now, consideration, you pay uh, one buck and you get some sort of service. That's where you need a digital consideration, and that's why cryptocurrency comes into play, is because you need to be able to automate the process of cash transfer or some sort of asset transfer to pay for whatever you're buying. And so when people say, why cryptocurrency? Why do you do an ICO? Why do you need this digital currency? Uh, Probably majority of the time, the answer is you don't. But some of the times you do. And, and when it comes to uh, completing a contract for a, a fractional ownership of a real object, you also, if you're going to automate 95% of the process, you better automate the last 5% as well, which is the swap of the consideration to make that contract a legally binding contract. So we are minting our own cryptocurrency. Uh, the company is called Look Lateral. The, the cryptocurrency is called The Look. Uh, look out for it. It's coming soon. Um, and so we, we know that we are not blockchain experts, so we have partnered with Dragon Chain. They're our strategic partner on the blockchain side of it uh, over in Bellevue. They're a, a Disney spinoff. And so one of the questions before was, will there be hundreds or thousands of these types of markets which will basically trim you down to zero? Well, it depends. In the art world, it's a very you know, uh, tight marketplace. It's very hard to get into it. And so we think that our, some of our expertise helps us with that. Uh, that, that works. Great. Thank you. <coughs> so one of the things that uh, I think happens is that I have this weird long ID, and that represents my wallet. And I have this way of talking about that thing, which nobody here can remember their wallet ID. <laughs> and so it becomes really difficult after a while. And in fact, there's a significant amount of Bitcoin that's sitting out there free because people forgot their wallets. And so who knows whether they're going to get it back or not. Um, somehow you have to tie this digital thing down to who the people are for real. And you'd like to know uniquely who a person is. And so um, we have this Estonian experiment that's going on where the government in Estonia is 100% digital, and they have applied this to a whole bunch of things. And Oleg, could you dive in a little bit to your experiences with digital identity and the process of using blockchain to drive some pieces of those business transactions in Estonia? Well, maybe in that case, uh, we have to uh, die for a couple of minutes just to understand what digital identity is about. Mm. So uh, it's the, the most kind of the most common thing uh, or the most uh, uh, famous thing is so-called ID card, right? But we have to understand, I mean, that this ID card I'm showing to you, that's not a digital identity at all. That's the first fundamental thing. So, I mean, this digital, uh, this ID card I'm showing to you, what has enormous penetration in Estonia, so nowhere in the world, uh, there is no any single country in the world, but there's a penetration of more than 90%. So for a tiny country of Estonia with a population of 1.3 million people, uh, there is 1.1 million of these ID cards issued. So uh, this card has two major functions. So first of all, that's a normal travel document. So they have kind of dozens of uh, security elements here, like UV print, like micro print, and so on and so on. So that's, that's a document identifying myself in real life. If policeman is meeting me, then uh, I'm showing this card. 
So instead of showing my uh, <coughs> driving license, I'm showing this card, and uh, on my ID, personal identification numbers, they see do I have the valid driving license right now or not. And another part of the story, that so-called uh, chip here with two applications only. So that's an application for uh, for uh, aut uh, authentication of the person and the uh, application for digital signature. But that's not a digital ID. That's just one of the uh, one out of many form factors. So we do have so-called mobile ID, what is embedded on the level of uh, of uh, SIM card or phone. We do have so-called e-residency, uh, what uh, John just showed. That so-called digital ID card, what is the uh, fourth uh, form factor of that. But we have to understand that a digital identity, that's not about the card. So uh, <coughs> you have to, uh, to build certain link between the ID what you're using in e-channels and the physical person. So and this link is built uh, in Estonian context through the two central registers. So one is so-called population register. So in population register, what is a uh, governmental hold? So in population register, uh, for every single person, we are assigning the ID code what is unique, what cannot be changed. The, I mean, more or less cannot be changed. So there are certain exceptions, but they are very rare. So, uh, and uh, this code is absolutely unique. And another part of that game, that's uh, now for this ID code, you're assigning certain certificate. The certificate is something what is uh, acting in internet, right? So the second part of the register, it's, uh, it's held by private company. So it's consortium of two telecoms and two banks. So this uh, fantastic example of public-private partnership, what is happening in Estonia. But those two register, first of all, uh, to, to put together the person and his ID code and then ID code and uh, the certificate of what is uh, working in the internet, that's the basis of this uh, digital identity. That's why I argue that, that this, uh, on the card, this 12-digit uh, long ID code, that's much more digital identity than the card by themselves. So, and, uh, and we do have in that story certain blockchain uh, links as well. So, uh, but this, is, uh, this specific story is built, down to build up on a central register. So that's some, it, it's actually it's, uh, it's reference to your discussion what you have a few minutes ago. That, uh, that philosophically, if you, for whatever reasons, if you don't trust the central register, if you don't trust the government, to provide certain functions, you don't trust the, the central register. In that case, you're building the ledger. So you're building the distributed something so that the uh, certain amount of players, they are uh, guarantee that this information is valid. So you're building kind of ledger here. So we are lucky enough in Estonia that, that, that those, uh, we do trust government. So, and, uh, and uh, the central register in not in all the cases, but in most of the cases. It's much more cost efficient than to build the blockchain. But there are tons of situations when you just cannot, uh, for certain reasons, you just cannot use a central register. And uh, the use case what we are using in Estonia, so we are, uh, we are building the chains out of logs. That's one of the use cases what you mentioned. So uh, we are uh, building the chains out of the timestamps of the operations. So we are just for hashes of the operations. We are building the kind of the chains uh, and uh, we have uh, both governmental and the private companies like Guard Time, for example, working on that. So uh, we, we do have certain block, uh, blockchain kind of uh, related uh, use cases here, but still uh, the, the major majority of, of this story with Estonian e-identity, that's central based. So what kind of uh, business operations <coughs> are enabled by the fact that there's a digital ID and where does some kind of ledger play a role in that? So I'm an Estonian, well, so I'm an e-resident. Because I'm an e-resident, that lets me do something. What can I do with that that otherwise wouldn't happen? And, and just to be clear, e-residency is this fictitious thing that allows me to um, connect in through that registry but doesn't give me residency in the country nor travel rights. It's just a very specific relationship, which is? Well, you're putting me to quite complicated situation because mm -hmm. I can talk about this for hours and hours. So yeah. I, I will leave no any single word to other panelists here. So uh, I, I do understand that I'm not very objective here. So uh, as a person who has born there, as a person who uh, has built uh, or has been participating in building of this story, I do believe that it's the most sophisticated uh, e-governance model what exists right now in the world. 
but uh, especially if, uh, I mean, I, I've relocated here for three months ago and will be staying here for closest year approximately. So uh, being here, I understand how much convenient life I'm living there. <coughs> if I'm not visiting the governmental agencies for uh, years, literally, if all the kind of, the, uh, starting from the most obvious operations, like, I don't know, like ordering me uh, the new uh, driving licenses and up to the uh, quite complicated and, uh, and not so much obvious one, like, like, like ordering or prolonging of my uh, gun permissions, for example, all of them are, I'm doing in internet. So all of them, without any exceptions. So the stories of the uh, e-health care, the e-police, uh, that's a story of, of a long of different systems working together. So I mean, we have uh, brought to internet, and actually it means the refactoring of the services as well. So we are not just copying uh, and pasting the services, but we are kind of refactoring the services and, uh, and uh, redesigning them so that, that they are working on a different matter in internet most of the uh, service. And that's why uh, there is quite a lot of things what, uh, what we have done for the first time in the world. The first in the world, e-elections, for example, what is already uh, there for 15 years, literally. The first in the world, mobile elections, for example, when you can just vote uh, for your uh, potential member of parliament through your uh, mobile phone, literally. The uh, biggest in the world penetration of the uh, of the internet banking, for example, so it's 99.9%. Uh, so uh, the feeling of uh, tax declarations, uh, what takes kind of literally 30 seconds, and then it's uh, more than 99% uh, of these uh, tax declarations are filled electronically. There's a lot of such Seven kind of parts. And I paid my taxes. Exactly. So and uh, and that's all because of the fact that that, that, that there is a tons of different systems uh, talking with each other on same universal language and one of the pillars behind that is exactly the uh, the fact that we can identify exactly that you are you so at you. the core is i know who the person is and therefore i can trust the transaction and then all of the other things go so right. when i want to get my drugs i go to any particular pharmacy they trust everything not only that i get to see who looked at my data so there's transparency both directions right right, right. But we can't do that in the United States because we don't trust the government because we don't have a central authority that's playing that game. So I want to go to Amit and talk about what Trusted Key is trying to do in the U.S. context. Yeah, uh, thank you. Good segue. Nicely done. Nicely done. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, with Trusted Key, uh, we had three basic goals. So, um, you know, as, as <coughs> we just discussed, if you have a truly remotable identity, where you can take your physical identity of who you are and remote it over the internet without you having to be physically present to prove your identity, that enables a very large number of scenarios like in Estonia. The problem is, uh, how do you do that in a way that is secure and reliable and not hackable? And so the principles we came up with that we aspired to was number one, this identity is so important that it has to be under your control and it cannot be owned by a third party. So for example, today when you have a digital identity, you know, whatever, xyz at gmail.com or at you know, apple.com or whatever.com, you don't actually own that identity. It's being lent to you or leased to you by Google or Microsoft or Apple or Amazon or whoever. Your identity is just too important for that to be the case, okay? Secondly, uh, and, so, so, and so that identity needs to be under your control, completely under your control, and for you to decide what to do with. Secondly, if you have a central store, as digital identity becomes more and more important, that store becomes a great target for hackers. Okay, it is, it is the place that I would hack if I was a hacker, right? Because once I compromise a whole bunch of millions of digital identities, I can do whatever I want, right? Um, so you know, if I imagine your, your your large neighbor to the east of you wanted to you know play some mischief, you know they would go after your central identity store, um, and you could do that in 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 in, go in governance, in commerce, etc. And so having a distributed ledger is really very really important there because then you can say there is no single thing to hack. There is multiple copies of this. Okay. And then the third part is. Uh, you need to have very strong cryptography and encryption, uh, making sure that you're securing the keys that you have under your control so that you can certify who you are and authenticate and sign things on, uh, on behalf of your digital identity. And so what that means in our case is that we have built a solution 
on the mobile phone platform, taking advantage of the fact that modern smartphones after the iPhone 6 and Samsung Note 6 have a secure enclave that sits right next to the CPU. It's a piece of hardware on which you can store a secret which is non-extractable. You can do operations on the hardware, you cannot extract the hardware, you cannot extract the secret. Uh, we don't use the blockchain for operations. We don't use the blockchain for storing identity. We think that's an inappropriate use of the blockchain. We use the blockchain purely as a repudiation list where in case things get compromised, uh, we, can, we can store things on the blockchain which say, hey, this identity is no longer valid. Okay, or this certificate is no longer valid. The other advantage that has is that it is very, very uh, um, compatible with the idea that blockchain operations themselves can be slow moving and expensive. And so a repudiation list is something that is compatible with the idea because it's a presumably a low volume transaction stream. You can deal with uh, the long latencies and uh, higher processing costs of blockchain. So we have 5.2 billion cell phones in the world. Most of them converted over to some kind of smartness. Um, and the consequence of that is that if we all start using blockchain, then blockchain gets awfully slow, right? So it doesn't really scale to 5.2 people doing anything today with it, right? So how would you structure this so that it can scale, so that 8, 9 billion people can all do their um, taxes on, what day is this? Day before taxes? Today is tax day. Oh, today is tax day. So today, <laughs> right. you have to pay your taxes. Everybody goes and does their little seven click thing, and then the whole thing fails because blockchain can't process that number of transactions. Yeah, so the, you know, that's in, in some ways the point I was trying to make, which is those transactions don't actually happen on the blockchain in our case, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, Trusted Key uses blockchain as a repudiation list. Right, so the one out of a thousand times, the one out of a million times where you need to revoke, revoke a certificate mm -hmm. or somebody comes in and says, hey, I lost my phone or my, lost, my phone got stolen. Say, okay, we'll, the first thing we'll do is we'll revoke the certificates associated with the identity. Okay? And so that is orders of magnitude less frequent <coughs> okay, than uh, the idea of every single transaction happening on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. We're still talking billions. Now you're talking millions. Yeah. Okay. Or does the manager do less? Okay. Right. Okay. So that's point one. And now point two is as you, as we've already seen in cryptocurrency, as the transaction volumes of cryptocurrency has gone have gone up, there have been innovative ways in which you've they've enabled microtransactions, fractions of Bitcoin, for example, in order to enable larger transaction volumes. So you know, part of the belief is that the right innovation will happen on the platform. The other point I want to make is in terms of uh, a use case. If you think about you know, today being tax day, uh, how many of you are going to file your taxes using paper? Anybody? Paper? No, no I mean, it's not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not going to shame you. Okay, no. you are. Okay. So there's a 30% chance that in the next two or three months, you will get a letter from the IRS saying, thank you for filing the, your taxes. Uh, you may be a victim of identity fraud. Okay. And so now we want you to call in and verify your identity. Okay. Uh, now this happened uh, last year. This yeah, happened. Conversely, there's substantial fraud. Uh, Agree. Okay. No. 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 Again. No. no. Okay. My my goal in that question wasn't to to shame you. My goal was simply to illustrate a point, which is last year uh, about 11 million Americans got that letter from the IRS. Okay. I was one of them, okay? And so here's, here's the process I went through. So I called them up. My wait time was 45 minutes, okay? So now you, you know, that's 8 million hours of time down the, down the tube, of, of, of wait time, okay? Of bad elevator music, okay? <laughs> then you get on the phone with an agent, and the agent says, well, I need to verify your identity. I say, okay, great, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Okay, this is... Uh, Where were you born? This is KBA, knowledge-based authentication. Okay, so they'll ask me a bunch of questions going back 10, 15 years, which ordinary people are unlikely to have a recollection of, but hackers, because of the beauty of the internet, probably know more about me than not. <laughs> you know, than, than, you know, more about you than, you know, than, than you yourself. 
And so that system alone has a false positive rate of around 60%, okay, and a false negative rate of about 30%. It doesn't really work, okay? So now you're one and a half hours, and that process, by the way, takes about 45 minutes as well, okay? So about 40 minutes into the conversation, I asked the agent, I said, you know, we're having this somewhat frustrating conversation for both of us, okay? I said, okay, so what are my alternatives? And she said, well, you can always go into your local federal building in person and present your ID. Now, who wants to voluntarily go to the IRS in person, right? I mean, so this system doesn't work. And if, in fact, if you had an e-identity solution like you have in Estonia or the identity solution we're proposing with Trusted Key, you could imagine in the future you have a blockchain-based ledger or actually whatever. It doesn't have to be blockchain. It could be a website where you say, here are the social security numbers, IRS, Please don't accept a return from this number unless it's been signed by a digital certificate issued to, you know, issued on trusted key, right? It's an opt-in solution. And there you go. That just eliminates the fraud right there. Okay? And so now instead of spending two hours and 16 million hours of bad elevator music and frustrating conversations, you take 30 seconds, go blah, 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 and you're done. And you're done. And if you do that enough, then... In Estonia, the military budget is less than the savings from digital, digital government, right? And so we have this e energy that can be spent on other things, and that's true across, across the board. all of us, right? So um, we're, we're starting to get to the point where I want to get to a QA. and a Yeah. And so before we do that, I would like each of you to say, what could this group of people do or benefit if they – engaged with your thing that you are doing um, that would, you know, put money here or make this benefit there happen? Sure. Uh, so we are still building on our platform. Well, um, let, let me ask a question. How many people here want to see climate change reduced? Okay. Just How many people here want to see climate change reversed? Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> soon enough... Uh, hopefully by the end of the year, you will be able to go to nori.com, like the seaweed, N-O-R-I, um, and calculate your footprint and purchase carbon removal certificates and say, hey, listen, I am now accounting for the fact that I emitted or that I'm responsible for, you know, 2,000 tons of emission this year, if you're really good, and then I purchased CRCs for 2,000 tons of uh, CO2, and I had a zero footprint. Um, the... The part that I really get excited about is I think right now um, we tell people, okay, you can calculate businesses too. You can calculate um, how much emissions you have and then what you want to uh, buy in terms of removal. Um, and people are going to start getting to zero, right? They're like, okay, I want to have zero impact, zero impact. I'm really, really, really excited for when um, people are like, okay, I've, got, I've had zero impact for the last five years, but I was alive for like 25 years before that. So let me start like paying down my debt of carbon, um, and then that's how we're really going to start reversing climate change. And then, um, so yeah, so go to nori.com, and then you'll see, I think in the future too, um, you know, maybe a decade or so, that people will, uh, carbon accounting is going to be part of our everyday lives. It'll be part of, um, like, buying gas or whatever it is. Um, we'll have an embedded system. So uh, be part of the revolution of reversing climate change and go to nori.com. Yeah, as as, uh, as you were describing your solution, I was just thinking that uh, that would make a just think about how how much you could enhance your Tinder profile oh, with yeah. the fact <laughs> that you you zeroed out your carbon footprint. Yeah. I mean, I have zero carbon badges. footprint. Exactly. Yeah, your little yeah. badge on there. Uh, we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wait, uh, I could sell that through Tinder. Anybody know anyone at Tinder? Yeah. <laughs> That's a conversation. Um, <laughs> So Trusted Key is a platform. It's a platform for digital identity. You know, I talked about one use case, which is this IRS fraud scenario. Uh, we're talking to literally dozens of developers who are uh, hundreds of developers who are exploring scenarios with us. And we'd love to talk to you about ideas you might have for using this, this digital identity platform for enhancing and solving new scenarios and improving existing ones. 
Okay, so uh, what we provide uh, hopefully is a uh, method of uh, increased uh, art ownership, um, increased liquidity into art that you already have, uh, inc increased interest into the entire art space because the vast majority of people feel that they're simply priced out of the market. And then we're also building a provenance system that all of the details of all the art get uploaded onto the, the blockchain with a, a tag on the art that can be tracked. Um, and so there's a lot of transparency that we're trying to build into the, into the market as well, beyond just the ability to transact. So we're, we're really hoping to uh, not just help people's ability to diversify their portfolios, but also to help the art world be a little bit more accessible and transparent. And what you can do is you can just you know, look on our website and, and uh, we'll be launching very soon, um, within the next couple months. So how many people have ever considered art as an asset that they would consider investing in? Oh, look at that. Uh, yes. Now you can. <laughs> well, well, if you are uh, considering uh, doing business with Europe, if you are considering of uh, cooperation with uh, European companies, if you are considering uh, doing the uh, joint scientific or research with European uh, science or uh, research centers, then one of the best gateway, I'm absolutely sure, is Estonia, part of the European Union. And uh, in order to identify yourself, the e-residency, that's absolutely unique program that Estonia launched uh, a few years ago, what is growing like a mushroom right now. So it's, uh, that's, that's the best way to do that. And uh, we're just right now discussing with John as well, I mean, how to, how to boost uh, the spread uh, of this uh, e-residency program here in the uh, Puget Sound area. And uh, I do encourage you uh, to, uh, to use that benefits of, of that specific program. And in addition to that, I mean, everybody of you are more than welcome to come to Estonia. And uh, just, I mean, living there for a week, you can see how much different life could be in e-society, in true e-society. So just welcome to Estonia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I looked into that because I read all about what you guys are doing. And I was like, yes, I want to do that. But you have to go to like San Francisco to New York or, and, or New York. There yeah. are a couple places. So we need to get that here in Seattle. So we could just apply in Seattle. <laughs> so I've been trying to get the, the consulate in New York. If I get enough people here to sign up to get them to come here. So if anybody wants e-residency cards, give me your name and I'll put you on a list and we'll work on getting them to come here because we have enough people. They, go, they don't have a group in San Francisco, they just sometimes go there to oh, give I them see. because there's enough people there. So if we have enough people signing up, we can get that to happen here. I am an e-resident because I'm doing contracting work in Estonia and they struggle with signed pieces of paper. They're not sure what to do with it because they've been working on this for 20 some years now. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier for me to do contracts with them if I just sign the thing digitally. And so understand Estonia is part of Europe and as part of Europe, it's the largest current market in the world of seven, 750 million people. And so uh, I can sign a contract, I can open a bank account, I can engage in business there all 100% digitally in about 15, 20 minutes. I can have that all done and go. Anyway, at this point, how many people have questions? Only a few. Questions. We're going to be coming over to the mic that's over here. Yep. Um, and then making a line back this way. So if you want to start coming over here to make that line. Yeah. Mm, a couple more. Thank you very much. It was a very valuable discussion. I have a quick question to Amit. I still couldn't quite understand how trusted ID will prevent identity theft. I still feel like it's another two-step identity protection, especially when you talk about like a, you only use blockchain repudiation process. I'm worried that if someone stole my cell phone, uh, will I be prone to an identity theft? That's one question. And another question is, what's your revenue model? Okay. Uh, good question. Um, so here's what happens. When you, when you provision yourself on trusted key, uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll create a uh, public-private key pair of, uh, of, of cryptographic keys. 
And the public key, as you know, is, is going to be published along with the identity, perhaps on the blockchain, on a website, wherever. The private key is stored securely in the secure enclave on your phone. Okay? And your secure enclave is protected by your PIN, by your password, by your biometrics, whatever you choose. So if you lose your phone, uh, some random person is not going to have access to that unless they also had, you know, they did the James Bond thing of cut off your finger or, you know, whatever. Okay? Now, that's kind of an extreme thing. Uh, so assuming that is not the case, you know, that's how your, your key is secured. Now, once, you're, once you have a private key, that enables a whole set of new protocols for establishing identity. So, for example, one of the most secure ways in which you can prove identity or, or log into something uh, is not using a username and password. Instead, it's to use something called challenge response. Okay, it's a cryptographic protocol which uh, is immune to things like man-in-the-middle attacks, replay attacks, things like that, which uh, usual password combinations, username and password combinations are not. Okay? So for example, uh, one example of challenge response is starting about two years ago. Uh, in the US, everybody with a credit card got a new credit card from the bank with a, with a chip in it, right? with a secure chip. That secure chip also has a secure enclave with a secret key. And when you put your, that credit card into a terminal at a merchant in a uh, offline scenario, the, there's, an, it, there's a challenge response protocol that exchanges keys between the terminal and your card. Okay? And that protocol is, again, uh, immune to replay attacks, man in the middle attacks, those kind, of, those kind of spoofing attacks. As a result of the deployment of these cards, most credit card fraud has now moved from offline to online. Okay? It's basically eliminated offline fraud. And the only time offline fraud happens is when a merchant does not have a chip-enabled terminal for processing. Okay? So that's been a dramatic difference just in two years. Okay? And we can do exactly that for regular login scenarios. So for example, when you, go into a, when you log into a bank or your brokerage or your you know, whatever, your Gmail account, um, Imagine instead of trying to remember username and password, which can get stolen or hacked or whatever, it is completely challenge response enabled. Okay. Uh, now, th the thing that is different now versus, so you know, what I'm describing, this idea has been around for a long time. What is different now is that you now have devices, i.e., your smartphone, that are capable of securely storing the keys. Okay. In the past, if you wanted to do this, you had to remember a 500-digit number that you have to type in every time, which kind of doesn't make sense. Okay? Uh, okay? Specific to the revenue model. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, the revenue model. Um, so in the enterprise case, so we have a number of enterprise customers we are working with. In the enterprise case, our revenue model is similar to the SaaS revenue model. You know, we, we charge per transaction. In the consumer case, um, the ideas that we are exploring right now are we charge for writes, but not for reads. Okay, and we can talk offline on exactly what I mean there. A similar question for both uh, Nori and Fimart is what, what is the revenue model? Who writes the blockchain and how are they incentivized to do so and how does that um, factor into your cost structure? Uh, so for Nori, um, we are using the Ethereum blockchain to issue our own tokens um, and issue smart contracts to keep track of carbon removal certificates. Um, we are taking a portion of, okay, so there's two things, right? Um, I think Amit, you mentioned this in your categories. There's like the like ICOs, and then there's blockchain as applications. Um, and uh, Mike also mentioned this. So we are using blockchain as an application, but we also have a cryptocurrency, um, and that's called the Nori. Um, and the uh, one Nori will always have the same exchange rate as um, for one to one. So one Nori token will always buy one CRC. One CRC is one ton of CO2 removed. So depending on what price you buy that Nori token in the marketplace, that will change with the US dollar. But you can always, if you've got 10 Nori in the bank today, you can always buy 10 tons of CO2 removed tomorrow. Um, so we are taking a portion of those transactions um, to run our businesses, um, our business. Um, and our first clientele right now are pretty much big businesses who have a strong sense of responsibility for their environmental impact. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, that's how we make money.
We have a couple different revenue uh, streams. Our main revenue stream is just transaction fees. It's, you know, it's a marketplace, so every time you buy and sell, there's a percentage that is uh, applied to split between the buyer and the seller. Uh, also, when, when the original artist first uh, fractionalizes their art and then sells their original chunk, we, li we limit it to uh, they have to sell uh, no less than 10%, but no more than 49%. This means that they always retain uh, majority ownership, which means that they also retain possession rights. So uh, this means that all the uh, transaction, transactions that are swirling around, each one of them generates a, um, you know, a, a percent fee. There's also a mechanism where, uh, based on preset rules, they can automatically buy back all of the uh, uh, fractions, and that would also trigger a, a large uh, fee structure. But given that the art market is paying between 5, 10, 15, 25% or more of the uh, cost of the art to sell at uh, auctions or various different um, galleries, they're, they're getting a pretty screaming deal uh, on our platform because we can automate the entire process. Wonderful. First off, thank you guys. It's uh, been quite informative. It's been quite informative. And uh, so first, I got two comments. Or, uh, a comment and a question. Uh, first is I run the Blockchain Seattle conference, which is going to be in September, and I'd like to have all you guys participate in that. Um, that's first. Then the second is um, John mentioned, uh, alluded to scalability earlier. Uh, I mean, one of the categories that you didn't include in your five was actual protocol and actual base protocol development. I'm wondering for all of you guys, what are some of the technical constraints or Put another way, what are some of the innovations that you need to see at the protocol level that will enable your businesses to be more efficient, more effective, more successful going forward? I guess I can start. Um, definitely the uh, speed of transactions are important. Uh, blockchains are notorious for having a relatively either a slow uh, block uh, time or a very limited size of their block to be able to put a certain number of transactions. But, uh, and that's, that's where we start talking about the scalability issue. But whenever there's a problem, there's a solution. New protocols are coming on where the uh, block time is much faster, the block size is higher, there's different compression. There's a lot of different technologies that are solving a lot of these problems almost faster than, than what we need them to be. We're also doing a combination of, of different protocols. We have our uh, cryptocurrency being traded on the Ethereum network, but we have, a, in our case, a dragon chain blockchain that tracks all of the actual fracs, which I call them, fractional art contracts which is on a completely separate blockchain. So we have, we have it separated into different chunks that we can actually have uh, different protocols running at different times. Uh, I'd like to see it get easier for new people who are not into blockchain and have their own wallets and cryptocurrencies set up to like just get into the Nori marketplace and buy carbon removal credits. Um, it's a process and it's uh, really, it's a design challenge as much as an engineering challenge to make sure that um, people can get into the cryptocurrency space more easily without all like these crazy hurdles um, like you, you'd like the little seven click option to be <laughs> into Nordic yeah like it should be it should be no more than 10 minutes but right now it's, it's gonna take longer than that you gotta have like a wallet set up and you have to do you know XYZ things um, and you have there's a certain literacy that like technical literacy that I I don't think um, if blockchain is gonna scale in the category of applications especially for social impact we have to make it super easy for everybody and anybody to use it um, just like what they're doing in Estonia um, so that's that's a big thing for me uh, for me I think the uh, the big the, the big uh, question for me and the unknown for me is uh, how do you make sure that you can preserve velocity of transactions and reduce latency um, and a large number of participants um, while providing, continuing to provide an, an incentive structure for people to participate in the, in the mining or the, or the, or, you know, or the blockchain uh, process? That's one of the critical roles that cryptocurrency plays you know, traditionally. Uh, but it's also the reason why blockchain is getting faster, you know, it's getting slower and more expensive. And so the question for me is, what is the long-term mechanism by which you'll, you can have a high scale, low cost, low latency, and highly replicated infrastructure? 
because uh, you know, one extreme is that you just have a database, and we've talked about that a few times. The problem with the database is then you don't have the distribution, <laughs> the, uh, the scalability, and the resiliency from, from hacking or, or compromise. And I don't think we yet have a good enough solution from a platform perspective to solve all those requirements. Time. If you want to take your answer and boil it down to 20 seconds, that would be. <laughs> no, I, I'm exactly on the same side. So I mean, it's uh, it's exponentially growing world, you know. So and the speed speed of transaction that's exactly the major constraint. So meaning speed of transaction, meaning cost of transaction as well, you know. So that's exactly the major constraint. Great. So if you would uh, thank our speakers. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. We, they have to reset this room. So if everybody would go out there, they'll reset the room, and we can continue talking out on the other side. <laughs>